Uh, thank you all for coming. This is the first session that we have on the course on IFAS, that is Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences and the wonderful work that they're doing. And in the six lectures, we'll basically get just a taste of what's going on, not the whole picture. So I think you will enjoy the different varied things that you will hear in this course. I want to just acknowledge here the help that I got uh, in setting up this course from my old colleague, Bill Thatcher. Bill and I worked together in more than 50 years ago. I worked in his lab in dairy science. And believe it or not, I went out and worked with the cows. But about once or twice after being near the cows, I decided it wasn't for me. I was only going to stay in the lab and do the lab work. But I did, but we did work together for about three years. Um, and um, thank you, Bill, for setting this up. He's co facilitator of the course. Um, I would now uh, like to introduce Dr. Gilbert, vice president and um, of uh, IFAS and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Florida. And he will introduce the course and our speaker for today. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming and inviting us to this beautiful facility. This is my first time at Oak Hammock. I might have to move here. It's a wonderful facility. And I'm jealous of your, your educational programs look phenomenal, which was an excellent job on this seminar series, and you have many more to take advantage of. Um, you know, the six lectures that you're going to see here are going to run a gamut of topics from salmon to blueberries to forest management. And I hope it'll demonstrate the breadth of what we do in IFAS, Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, um, and what we attempt to do as a land-grant university. Uh, Dr. Hansen, I'll introduce him in a moment. It's going to give us the history and development of the land grant system. And we're so proud of this system, which was developed in the 1860s, that really was designed to bring education, not just to the elites of the United States, but to everyone in the US and really help protect our food production and natural resources. And it's been spectacularly successful. So it's my honor to be here today. Um, uh, if you attend all six of these lectures, you'll be well on your way to be an expert on feeding the world yourself. So thank you for that. Um, I'm very proud of all of our faculty. Not only do they inspire me with their discoveries, but they work hard to make sure that what gets discovered gets shared. What happens in the lab should not stay in the lab. As we'll hear in a moment, extending scientific knowledge to people who can benefit, benefit from it is part of the land-grant mission. Few men or women are more shining examples of the land-grant mission in action than your speaker, Dr. Pete Hansen. Dr. Hansen has the title of Distinguished Professor, this is a rare distinction going only to those faculty members with an exceptional record in teaching, research, and public service that is recognized internationally. He is the Red Larson Professor in the UF IFAS Department of Animal Sciences, and he is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Hansen was the first to develop a solution to infertility induced by heat stress in dairy cows. He's a first-rate researcher. He's also a tremendous teacher and mentor who has mentored 29 PhD students 19 master's students and sponsored 61 postdocs and visiting scientists. I am pleased to be able to sing Pete's praises because he so often trumpets his colleagues' achievements instead of his own. For example, I know he's used his status as a uh, AAAS fellow to successfully nominate at least two other members of his department. That's a lot of work and he doesn't get paid extra for it. He does that because he's a servant and a public servant at that. So since he won't say it himself, I will. I present to you one of the most distinguished, accomplished, and selfless of all of our U of IFAS faculty, Dr. Pete Hansen. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you. much. Wasn't yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Gilbert. That's uh, very humbling and very much appreciated. You know, I am going to give you a brief history today of the land grant university system and uh, in in the United States, and then how it formed here in the state of Florida. When I was a freshman in 1974 at the University of Illinois, the first course everybody had to take was a one-hour course called Agriculture 100, 
And in the first thing we learned in Agriculture 100 was what the land grant system was, why it was formed, and how it developed. And you know, before I came to the University of Illinois, I don't think I'd ever heard the word land grant system or land grant university. And when I first heard Dean Garner at the University of Illinois talk about how the land grant system was formed, you know, I felt very proud to be part of it. And, you know, I'm so fortunate that I've been able to spend my entire career at land grant universities and to be part of the University of Florida, which, uh, you know, really does meet its mission of the land grant system, which like Dr. Gilbert said, is to uh, educate the citizens of the country and use that knowledge to increase the economic well-being of the citizenry. The land grant university was really the result of the reimagining of what a university should be like. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And the focus of the land grant university from its very beginning was to bring education not to the elites of society, but to the laboring classes, if I use the language of the 19th century, to bring education to people involved in agriculture, commerce, industry, make education practical and fuse it with knowledge obtained from research and allow that education to increase the, or to better the lives of the people who went to the school, but also society at large. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, the history of how universities came to be in the colonies, what later became the United States. I think if you look at all of the original universities uh, in the 13 colonies, all of those schools originated for one purpose, to, to educate ministers for the Protestant religion. And then there was probably a secondary purpose that developed later, which was to educate gentlemen so that gentlemen could hobnob with each other and show off their sophistication and knowledge of Greek and Latin and uh, the, the great writers in English. You know, this is uh, Massachusetts Hall from Harvard University, one of the older buildings on campus, started in 1718. And the school itself was founded in, 1830, in 1636. It's the oldest university in, in the US. And in 1643, the trustees of the university spelled it out. Why did they create Harvard University? To advance learning and perpetuate to posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. And I think all of the old universities in the United States had as their mission, and many of them still do, educating uh, ministers or priests. So this man, Jonathan Baldwin Turner, who was born in Massachusetts in 1805, was a product of one of those early universities. Uh, he was a graduate of Yale University in 1833. He was an unusual man, I think. He, he was a Christian like, like everybody in the United States was, or almost everybody was, but he had kind of unconventional religious views. And while he was at Yale, he met this man, Edward Beecher, the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's cabin. And Beecher had taken a position at uh, Illinois College in Jacksonville, Illinois, not Jacksonville, Florida, and he convinced Turner to come to Illinois, which was the frontier, and uh, provide education uh, to the people of that part of the country. And Illinois College was itself a religious college, Congregational Presbyterian. So this is Turner as an old man, but as a young man, as a teacher at Illinois College, he became very active politically. He was very active in the anti-slavery movement, 
participated in the Underground Railroad. His religious views were not really in sync with the majority religious views of the college. And eventually, he was pushed out of the university in 1848. While he was at Illinois College and after, he started thinking, you know, what is the purpose or what should be the purpose of uh, a college in the United States? And he created an organization called the Illinois Industrial League to press for public funding of education for as he said, the industrial classes, the poor people of the country. And he first publicized this idea of creating a new kind of college, one that would uh, help the poor in 1850. So here in orange is Jacksonville, Illinois, not a very populated part of Illinois right now, but in the 1830s, it was one of the more populated parts of the state. And right next to it is Griggsville, Illinois. 1850, he gave a speech in Griggsville where he proposed a state university for the industrial classes. And he outlined what would eventually become uh, the land grant university. And then in 1851, he gave another speech on the same topic. In fact, he agitated for this around the country. So here's his plan from 1851. A lot of people disagreed strongly that this was the proper role of a university. In fact, they burned his farm down, the opponents of the land-grant university system. And people called his plan Turner's Folly. And I've never been able to find these cartoons, but there was a cartoon in the newspaper showing a professor in his robes plowing a field. Like, what a stupid idea this is to have professors teach agriculture. But he persisted and he tried to get a bill passed in Congress to create the land grant university system, but he was unsuccessful. But eventually this idea came to the attention of another Cong of a congressman, Justin Smith Morrill, who was originally a congressman from Vermont later became senator of Vermont. This is his homestead in Stanford, Vermont. And Morrill took up the cause. In fact, Morrill said he came up with it independently, not from Turner, but probably that's not true. But in any case, he communicated with uh, Turner and started pushing the idea of a land grant university in Congress. So five years after Turner proposed uh, industrial college, Michigan became the first state to create an agricultural college, Michigan State University. So not funded by the federal government, not part of the land grant system because there was no land grant system at that time, but it was the first agricultural college based on Turner's thinking. In 1857, Morrill put a bill into Congress to create the land grant system it didn't pass. So then in 1859, he tried again. This time, the bill, the Morrill Act, passed both houses of Congress, but James Buchanan, uh, the president, vetoed the legislation. And in fact, there was a lot of opposition to using the federal government for improvement of the economy, improvement of uh, agriculture and industry by the Southern states. So this is just a stamp that was issued in 1955 uh, by the United States uh, Post Office to commemorate the first uh, agricultural college in the United States. So big event occurred after 1859, the Civil War and the states with the congressmen and the senators that opposed the Morrill Act left the union and were no longer there to vote against the Morrill Act. So this is a handwritten letter from Morrill from the House of Representatives to Jonathan Baldwin Turner 
in December 1861. And Morrill says, I was delighted to find your fire by the letter of the 15th instant that had not all burned out. I presume I recognize Professor Turner, an old pioneer in the cause of agricultural education. I have only to say that amid the fire, smoke, and embers, I have faith that I shall get my bill into a law at this session. And he was right. Morrill resubmitted the bill in 1861. Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Act into law in 1862. Iowa was the first state to accept the terms of the land grant uh, act passed by Morrill, and the first state to actually open an institution created under the Morrill Act was Kansas State University. So if you go to the Capitol and look at the murals in the Capitol building, you'll see this painting of the first land-grant college opened under the Morrill Act, Kansas State University. I'm sure it's grown since this picture was was painted. So this is, I'm not gonna, this is the bill or parts of the bill. This bill proposes to establish at least one college in every state upon a sure and perpetual foundation accessible to all, but especially to the sons of toil, where all of needful science for the practical avocations of life shall be taught where neither the higher graces of classical studies nor that military drill our country now so greatly appreciates, right? This was during the Civil War, will be entirely ignored and where agriculture, the foundation of all present and future prosperity, may look for troops of earnest friends. People knew how to write in these days. Studying its familiar and recondite economies and at last, elevating it to that higher level where it may fearlessly invoke comparison with the most advanced standards of the world. And you know how successful the proponents of the Morrill Act were. This is a map showing all of the land grant universities and colleges in the United States. So because of the Morrill Act in 1862, there's one land grant university in every single state of the union. And then in 1890, the Congress passed a second Morrill Act to create a land grant university system for African Americans. Because especially in the Southern United States, blacks were banned from the land grant universities. So Congress created a second set of land grant colleges. So Florida A&M University in Florida is the 1890 school. And then in 1994, Congress passed a third land grant act creating tribal colleges on the reservations uh, in, in the United States. So the land grant system has really infused itself into every aspect of higher education in the United States. So here we are, 1863, we have the first institution created under the Morrill Act. So when was the University of Florida started? 1884. So 21 years after the first uh, university was created under the Morrill Act, even longer than that, after the Morrill Act, the University of Florida, it's not called the University of Florida, but it, it was, and I'll talk about that, was created. So why the delay? Well, here's the terms of the act. Each state receives 30,000 acres of federal land. So that's the land grant idea. This was not a new idea. Monarchs in Europe used to give some of their crown lands to build schools. So each state receives 30,000 acres of federal land for every congressional seat, except no state while in a condition of rebellion or insurrection against the government of the United States shall be entitled to the benefit of this act. And of course, Florida was in rebellion 
against the United States. If any of you go to Bicanopi and turn left at the Pearl gas station and go down the road about a mile or two miles, you'll come to a little cemetery where this man is buried, Madison Stark Perry, the fourth governor of the state of Florida. He led Florida out of the Union in 1861. And he had a plantation not too far from where he was buried. And then this man, Richard Keith Call, if you go to Stark and you go to the main street of Stark, it's called Call Street, named after Richard Call, who was the territorial governor of Florida before it became a state. So in 1861, the legislature of the state of Florida voted 62 to 7 to leave the union. And Richard Call was one of the seven. And after the vote, he jumped up and he said, and what have you done? You've opened the gates of hell from which shall flow the curses of the damned, which shall sink you to perdition. So he was not in favor of leaving the union. And he was right because during the next four years, the economy of the state of Florida was, was devastated. This is a scene from Volusia County, Florida. Gainesville was witness to two battles during the Civil War. You know, by the 1865, uh, the economy of Florida had been devastated. The civilian government in the state of Florida had been suspended. And Florida was under military occupation by the US Army. It's the third military district. Some very famous generals from the Civil War commanded Union troops in Florida after uh, the end of hostilities. John Pope and then George Meade was the victor at Gettysburg. So these men in succession attempted to rule the state of Florida after the end of the Civil War. And finally, in 1868, after the people of Florida agreed they would abolish slavery, uh, Florida was readmitted to the Union. Uh, and this is just the decree uh, announcing that Florida had been readmitted into the Union. But it was a much different Florida than the Florida before the Civil War. For one thing, Black people were allowed to vote. That's one of the reasons the military was there, was to ensure uh, the civil rights of the Black population. And they voted Republican. They voted for the pro-Union, anti-Confederate politicians. So the first governor, the state of Florida, after Florida re returned to civilian rule, was Harrison Reed. He was a Republican. He was born in Massachusetts. Even now, a lot of people from Florida don't like people coming from Massachusetts to come live in Florida. But he came to Florida to confiscate Confederate properties. So he took property away from uh, Floridians who had supported the Confederacy. And I don't know about him, but a lot of people like him became very wealthy uh, confiscating uh, Confederate property at the end of the Civil War. You know, he was one of the carpetbaggers. So he was elected in 1868. He, there were two attempts to impeach him, which were not successful. And he tried to get the land-grant university uh, for the state of Florida built. So in 1870, the legislature passed an act to create the Florida Agricultural College. And then in 1872, the legislature amended the act and they appointed the Reverend Charles Beecher as the first president. Who was he? He was the brother of Edward Beecher, the president of Jacksonville, or of Illinois College in Jacksonville, Illinois. He was the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe. So, I mean, he was, uh, um, uh, abolitionist, right? 
So he was going to be the first president of the University of Florida. And Florida got its land, 90,000 acres of land out in the West. And they set 10% of it aside to purchase a site for the university. They invested the rest of the money. And in 1875, they actually bought land in the town of Ugali, which I think is was right next to Melbourne, and Melbourne has kind of grown over you, Galley. So they actually built the building in 1875, but they never opened the school. And in 1878, uh, they abandoned the site. So why didn't they build the school? I'm not sure, but I have a, a suspicion. So a, the Alachua County Superintendent of Education, he said, all it needed, this is the Florida Agricultural College, was students and faculty. Verily, verily, Florida had a white elephant on her hands in the shape of an agricultural college. They had a building, no students, no faculty. And eventually, the building became the Granada Hotel, a private uh, business. And then in 1902, it burned down. So there's no remains of the first attempt of the state of Florida to build an agricultural college. So what happened between 1875 and 1878? The US military left the state of Florida. There was a very controversial election between Hayes and Tilden. And finally, the Republicans said, if you Democrats stop saying Tilden won the election, we will pull the military out of the South. So they did. The now military free governments of the Southern states suppressed the rights of Black people to vote. And the political uh, leadership of the states completely changed from Republicans to Democrats. And right around that time is when they abandoned the first uh, Florida Agricultural College. So. George Franklin Drew was the first governor after the military left, a Democrat. And they restarted the efforts to create a Florida Agricultural College. But instead of doing it outside of Melbourne, they built the Agricultural College in Lake City. So they chose Lake City as the site. The city donated some money, gave the state 520 acres of land, and in 1884, the first classes of the Florida Agricultural College were taught. So they had to get permission from the federal government to start spending the money for their agricultural college. So they had to send a letter to the uh, Bureau of Education. There was no Department of Education. And they had to say, here's our college. Here's what we're going to do. And these are the first faculty of the Florida Agricultural College. Okay, so they sent that to John Henry Eaton. He was the commissioner of education at the time. He had been a general during the Civil War, and he got interested in education because he oversaw 74 freedmen schools schools designed to teach freed slaves how to read and write. So, you know, I'm sure he had a big interest in education. This is where the Bureau of Education, which was part of the Interior Department, was located. So Eaton saw the list of faculty that the state of Florida proposed for their new agricultural college, and he wrote back saying, it's customary to have at least one professor of agriculture on the faculty of an agricultural college. So they looked at their list of faculty and they said, well, this professor Whitner, he's not a professor of Latin and Greek. He's our professor of agriculture, horticulture, and botany. And so they got their money and the school was created. And here is Lake City, in 1885, and it's pretty hard to see, but right here is the Florida Agricultural College. So if I blow that up, there's the main building of the Florida Agricultural College. 
1885. Here's an early photograph of that building. And they had a campus, not just this building. So this is Science Hall from the Florida Agricultural College. Here's the chemical laboratory made out of wood. Probably a dumb idea for a chemical laboratory, but that's what they did. Here's a greenhouse. This is Lake Alligator, which is the site of the Florida Agricultural Farms. So the college had 100 acres of land around Lake Alligator, 40 of which was usually underwater. So they had about 68 acres of arable land. And they started teaching classes. And you'll notice the classes were coeducational. So this is a picture from 1896. I found a yearbook that the class in 1901 from the Florida Agricultural College put together. And it's very entertaining. And Florida Agricultural College was kind of run as a military school. So everybody ate in the mess hall. And I don't think they like the mess hall food. So here's a little poem. Professor Stockbridge had a little goat. Its fleece was white as lead. One day it ate a mess hall biscuit, and now, poor thing, it's dead. And then they said, in the beginning, the legislature created the college and the board of trustees. The board of trustees created the faculty. The faculty created the superintendent. And the superintendent created the mess hall. And superintendent and the faculty and the board of the trustees and the legislature saw that it was good. Amen. So Florida Agricultural College and all the land grant colleges had a crisis in the early 1880s. And the crisis goes back to that cartoon of the professor uh, in his gown uh, plowing the land. Nobody knew anything about the scientific basis of agriculture. So they had professors teaching agriculture who didn't know anything. And I know at University of Illinois, they used to bring farmers in to teach the students about agriculture. And then the farmers said, why am I sending my kid to a school where they don't know anything? So this was a big problem. Uh, and one of the results was the schools had very bad reputations. Nobody wanted to send their kids to these agricultural schools. So the student enrollment was poor. And some land grant colleges relinquished the title. They thought it was not worth it. University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill was the uh, land grant college for North Carolina. They gave it up. Yale was the land grant university for Connecticut. They gave it up. And this man here, Kemp Plummer Battle, the president of UNC in 1887, he described their thinking in 1912. So he said, you know, what was the effect of the legislation to get rid of the land grant designation in regard to the university? Well, the loss of $7,500 a year was a serious matter, but it had its compensations, A, it relieved us of the charge that we were defrauding the farmers and mechanics, thereby creating much odium against us because they didn't know what they were teaching. B, it enabled us to avoid the scandal of having a low standard of admission, which was necessary for those intending to pursue the, quote, branches of learning relating to agriculture and mechanic arts. Our critics used this to support the charge that we did not have a true university. And C, it enabled us to develop the institution along the lines of the most improved, approved universities, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, without being embarrassed by the constant demand to build stables and workshops, buy prize cattle and modern machinery. And then lastly, it relieved us of the almost possible task of governing in harmony bodies of students of diverse training, modes of work, aims in life. So he was not very proud of the 
people at UNC who were involved in agriculture. So, I mean, this was a big problem. And around the same time, the U.S. got interested in some reforms in higher education that were led by Prussia, by, by Germany. And Wilhelm von Humboldt was the leader of this effort called the Humboldtian model of higher education, where institutions of learning would not just extend knowledge to students, but they would do research to create knowledge. So Johns Hopkins in 1876, that was the first university built in the United States on the Humboldt model, where the, from the very beginning, the idea is to do research, not just teach classes. And Mark Twain commented about Johns Hopkins. He said, the public is sensitive to little things and they wouldn't have full confidence in a college that didn't know how to spell job. So this idea is one that grabbed the attention of the leaders of the land grant university system. And in 1887, this man, William Henry Hatch, a congressman from the state of Missouri, created the Hatch Act. So he was a former Confederate soldier in the Civil War. He was very much a supporter of agriculture. His nickname was either Farmer Bill Hatch or Bull Butter Hatch, because he tried to ban margarine. So Hatch created or uh, proposed, and it was approved, this bill to give federal funding to each land-grant college to create an agricultural experiment station. So Dr. Gilbert, in his previous role, was director of the Florida Agricultural Experiment Station. This Hatch money still comes in to every state to support uh, agricultural research at the land grant university. They probably raised it from 15,000, but not enough. So now for the first time, the states usually associated with the land grant university could do research that they could use to uh, further advance uh, agriculture and engineering and have something more to teach their students. So this time it didn't take 20 years for the state of Florida to get on board. The year after the Hatch Act was passed, the Florida Agricultural Experiment Station was created. And the first director, who used to be the professor of moral philosophy and geology, was John J. Cost. And I think Dr. Gilbert will appreciate this too. Soon as the Florida Agricultural Experiment Station was created, the newspapers started complaining that it was ignoring their locality. It was more interested in abstract scientific research than solving the everyday problems of the Florida farmer. I'm sure you probably still hear that occasionally. So Cost was the first director of the experiment station. It was a separate institution from the university. And, you know, I'm an animal scientist, so the first person to study animals was George Troop Maxwell, who was a veterinarian. And in the Civil War, he was the colonel of the first uh, cavalry regiment of Florida. So right away, Cost and Maxwell started fighting. Because Cost, as the director of the experiment station, he was paid $1,500. But all the other scientists there were appointed on a half-time basis. So they only got $600. And Maxwell said he was promised full-time pay and he threatened to violence the cost unless he got it. And so then he wrote the board of trustees and he complained about cost, about his mendacity, his misappropriation and his mischief making at uh, the new Florida Agricultural Experiment Station. So then the Board of Trustees, they met soon thereafter, and they stated that Cost had shown a want of dignity and self-control 
wholly unbecoming one, occup one occupying his position. So they forced him to resign. And then for good measure, they fired Maxwell as well. So not very, so very humble beginnings. The very first experiment ever done in the Florida Agricultural Experiment Station was does Timothy grass, very uh, popular grass up north for cattle, does it grow in Florida? So yes, it did. So in the end, while they were at Lake City, you know, the experiment station published 27 research bulletins, over 2,700 pages of research on cassava and velvet bean for livestock. A lot of the research was focused on finding new crops that would grow in Florida. Texas cattle fever, which was a national problem, salt sick disease, which wasn't cured until the 20s. So it was very active. Here's a one experiment station from 1909 after moving to Gainesville, but I put it in here because it's from my department. If you want to read about how to feed steers in 1909, there you go. And even when they were in Lake City, there were experiment stations around the state. Today, we have 13 research and education centers throughout the Floridas so that we can do research in the environments where agriculture is actually taking place. But that is not a new idea. Even Florida Agricultural College up here, they had an experiment station in Ocala, Boca Raton, Fort Myers, and in the Panhandle in Defuniac Springs. That's the station staff in 1902. I'm gonna talk about uh, Dr. Stockbridge here in a second. Harold Hume, who Hume Hall, the Hume Scholars Program is named after. He started off as a staff scientist in Lake City. Horace Stockbridge was probably the most important animal scientist in the Florida Agricultural College. He later went on to become the first president of North Dakota State University, among other things. And if you look at the 1901 uh, yearbook of the students, the Florida Agricultural College, for each faculty member, they had sayings of the faculty. So under Stockbridge, it was raise cassava. And they had this picture. Here's Professor Stockbridge wearing a little hat made out of cassava. Here is a cow. You don't have to be an expert to realize this cow's not in good shape. Fed on cassava. Then they had another picture. These hogs were fattened on mess hall slop. These hogs were fattened on cassava. So what people didn't realize back then is when you harvest cassava, it has very high concentrations of cyanide. So if you feed it to livestock, they get sick. If you let it sit a couple of weeks, the cyanide evaporates and it's fine. So now we have two of the, you know, the organization of all land grant universities is like tripartite. We have education, you know, courses, we have research, and then we extend the results of our research to the whole world, to the citizenry at large through extension. So now in 1888, we have the Florida Agricultural College. We have the Florida Agricultural Research Station. They were not actually put together until the 1970s, but we don't have the extension. So before extension became a formal program, farmers used to organize themselves and put on these farmers institutes. And they were a combination of social activities like picnics, dances, music. And then they would also bring professors in from universities to talk about agriculture. So, you know, I'm just amazed at this picture from 1912. This is in Florida, July 4th. So, you know, it was very hot. And look at all the women in their big hot dresses, all the men wearing their suits. 
and probably enjoying themselves. Uh, Horace Stockbridge, the guy I was telling you about with cassava, he was the man who organized the first Farmers Institute in the state of Florida in 1899. And it was at that institute that farmers first started talking about this disease salt sick, which really limited cattle production in Florida. And then the university started working on it and uh, identified the problem in the 1930s, probably. So it took a while. So in 1914, Congress passed another bill, the Smith-Lieber Act, which gave federal funding to the land-grant universities to put on extension programs to deliver the results of their research uh, to the citizenry at large. And then we have the modern university. Florida Agricultural College did not like being called Florida Agricultural College. So almost as soon as they were formed, they petitioned the legislature, change our name to University of Florida. The legislature said, no, you're Florida Agricultural College. But then in 1903, they agreed that the Florida Agricultural College could change its name to the University of Florida. So here is the band from University of Florida in 1903. But not long after that, the Buckman Act was passed. So you know, at this time in Florida, there were all sorts of small colleges around in the state, supported by the state. And the legislature decided that that's not a good way to have higher education. So they merged the small, the six small colleges that they were supporting into three schools. The Florida Female College, these are not appropriate names for the 21st century, but the Florida Female College that later became FSU. Our name, the University of the State of Florida, kind of a clunky name, which was formed by the merger of the University of Florida in Lake City with the uh, East Florida Seminary in, in Gainesville. If you go to the Methodist Church just off of Main Street, you'll see Epworth Hall, which was uh, a building of the East Florida Seminary that was built before the merger of the two schools. And then the what later became FAMU was called the State Normal School for Colored Students. And the first president of the new university was the last president of the Florida Agricultural College, Andrew Sled. Originally from Emory, he got fired because he wrote an editorial saying that lynching was a bad idea. And then he came to Florida Agricultural College, eventually University of Florida. And they continue to do research looking for new crops. So this is a photo from 1914, showing the University of Florida campus. Not sure that might be Newell Hall. Everybody was keen on velvet beans, which later turned out to be a bad idea, but there was a lot of research done. So this is a picture of the 1895 class of the Florida Agricultural College on the banks of the Suwannee having a picnic. I'm just gonna end my talk Whatever happened to all those buildings in Lake City, the Science Hall, Chemistry Lab? Well, when University of Florida moved to Gainesville, they sold the buildings to a Baptist church that built a private Baptist college there. And in World War I, in 1917, when the US went to war, all the students, from the college joined the army. So the college closed. And then the college trustees rented the land back and the buildings back to the army to take care of wounded soldiers. And eventually that became the Veterans Administration. So this building here, which is the Veterans Administration Hospital in Lake City is built right on the site of the old Florida Agricultural College. So that's it. A very interesting history as far as I'm concerned.
That was fascinating, Pete. But I wonder if you would take just a few minutes to tell us about your work that you're doing, that you've been doing, just to bring us up to you this stage. Just me to a few talk. minutes, just, just, just a couple of minutes, so you know we get an idea of where we come from, and where we are now. Yeah, that's that's good. I have another seventy-five slides. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I'm I'm in the Department of Animal Sciences. So we are focused on research, education, and extension on all aspects of agriculture related to animals. Because of the nature of the state and the kind of animals that are raised here, we have a lot of focus on beef cattle, on dairy cattle, and on horses. We do a little bit with sheep, a little bit with pigs, but they're not a very important species uh, economically in the state. So I'm a reproductive biologist, so I study how to get cows pregnant, really and how to keep them pregnant once they're pregnant. And beef cattle are very fertile. Dairy cattle are not. When we've selected dairy cows to produce the vast amounts of milk that they produce, uh, we've also selected cows to be infertile. So, you know, a dairy cow today probably produces four times as much milk as it did in 1940. So Bill Thatcher, did a lot of groundbreaking work on trying to develop methods to get dairy cows pregnant. I've worked on that, especially with the problem of heat stress, because when a cow produces all that milk, it's very much like an athlete. It's burning fuel to produce that milk. So it's heat production, you know, it's metabolic rate, is about four times that of a cow that doesn't produce milk. It's kind of like a Tour de France racer, right? They're generating so much heat just riding that bicycle. So a dairy cow's like that. So they're very susceptible to hyperthermia from heat stress, more than most animals. So I do a lot of research on how to either make cows more resistant to heat so they can better regulate their body temperature or to find ways to bypass some of the negative effects of heat stress. So, you know, we found genes that exist naturally and we've put those genes into breeds of cattle used for making milk. So they're more resistant to heat stress. And then cows exposed to heat stress um, are infertile. And so, Bill Thatcher was the first person to show this, but we can use embryo transfer, take an embryo, produce it in the lab, put it into a cow, and improve its fertility during the summer. So I do a lot of work on that. Um, so, it, and you know, I teach classes, like I love my job. Um, you know, it's not really a job. I mean, I know push down Bill. Rob, all feel the same way. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful from uh, Velvet Beanstand to genetics and cows. Yeah. Questions? I noticed in some of your slides, uh, was the University of Florida always co-educational? You know, I, yeah, I know, I said it was co-educational because those men and women were in the picture together. And then as soon as I said that, I said, I bet he's going to challenge me. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't, I can't actually say that with certainty. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. When did it first become yeah. co-educational? How, how about faculty? I noticed on one of your slides they had a list of faculty, and it looked like a woman's name teaching something. That I don't know at all. My guess is it was late, except for like home ec, right? All the land grant colleges had home ec, and a lot of those teachers were were women. But it's a good question. I don't know if you know when was the first female faculty member. When were the first black students admitted to the University of Florida? What I've been told. Very recently. 
and I am a native of this area, interested in these colleges and attended them, is that women were not allowed to go until the mid 40s, except if they were teachers, they could go to UF in the summers and oh, take really? classes. And I have a teacher that I had in this county that was in that group. That makes more sense than what I said, truthfully. Well, along those lines, Pete was telling me at lunch that I, me, was probably the first reproductive endocrinology female at the University of Florida. I and I so. never thought of it that way. And that was in the 70s. In the 70s, probably the first woman who was working in endocrine uh, reproduction. And just, just, yeah, the Google. Um, the first female faculty was actually in 1918, Ida May Lee, professor of chemistry. Oh, but, okay. but female students, there were some in the 1920s, but really very low percentage until after World War II. Yeah. Okay. I have a question concerning they say that um, agricultural property, you know, acreage would be given to the university. And how was that obtained? Uh, and why would it be now located on campus? Or how was it moved? Or was it uh, some exchange? Or can you tell me how the agricultural promise of acreage uh, was arrived here. In yeah, I used to think land grant act, federal government gave land in Florida to build a school, but that's not what they did. They gave land out west and they sold the land and used the cash from the land sales to build the university. And then I remember reading that some states, like New York, they fixed it so that when the land was granted out west, they got the most valuable parcels of land. So they were able to sell the land for more per acre than some states that weren't as clever, making sure they got the more valuable land. So it was actually, you know, federal land out in out in the western United States that. I'm from uh, Texas, and Texas uh, created out of every section, 40 acres had to be allocated to public education. Now, when you think about that with the size of Texas and uh, the prominent uh, on campus alumni center is, is called the 40 acre club because that was the source of the money and they found out that they could move it so they moved it to uh, the godforsaken place of the permian basin which is the biggest oil reserve in the state of law of texas but that was pretty short-sighted this lady over yeah. here has yes. a question i just wanted to get a shout out to the women and girls that this extension service has provided. My parents wisely moved from Illinois to Arkansas, where I grew up, and the women there were taught how to make clothing, even out of feed bags. That was, and the extension service director said, this is not handmade. No, it's not homemade, it's handmade. They taught women to be proud of what they could do, and we in 4-H work, oh my gosh, it totally opened a whole new a whole new door for me. I went to the University of Arkansas where we had a girls cooperative house for 40 girls that were, were there. We got scholarships. It was just the farmer's daughter never looked so good. And I'm an, I, that's what I am. I'm the farmer's daughter and proud of it. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. You know, I feel, this gets political, but... You know, the people of the United States invested in the education of everybody. And, you know, the land grant university is the epitome of that, not just because they focused on people in agriculture and industry, but because they tried to extend everything they learned widely. And, you know, sometimes I think land grant universities are so focused on their rankings 
in the you know whatever ranking that they lose sight of that. You know, there's a lot of students who can't get into the University of Florida because their grades aren't good enough. Probably some of those students should get here. When uh, President Sassy was here, he said that our IFAS, IFAS is ranked number two in the country and probably in the world, which is fantastic, right? Is that correct? I think we're number one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> at least <laughs> working towards definitely, I mean, it depends how you rank it, but we're definitely yeah up there. Yeah, in the world, probably. Well, I went to uh, land grant school in Maryland, uh, and in the state of Maryland, the, the time I was there, if you graduated from high school, you were automatically admitted to the university, and that's not the case here. Yes, it is. It used to be like that, that all Florida students would get oh, admission, not it's anymore. It's tricky. Dr. Gilbert can correct me if I'm wrong. It, there's a law in Florida, if you finish junior college, you can go to any university that you want for the second two years, but you're not necessarily admitted into the program. You So if you want to be a psychology major, they may not let you in. So probably... Half of our students of Florida come as junior, as juniors, because they couldn't get in as freshmen. Their grades weren't good enough, but they can get in as a junior. So, yeah, just a couple of comments on this. In terms of where IFAS ranks, we're number one in the nation in research expenditures and agricultural and natural resources, federal expenditures. So we're very proud of that, but I think what we're more proud of is we're able to have the practical programs to answer the so what questions and, and the impact of people's lives around the state. So we do a lot of basic research, but we do a lot of applied research and great extension, and we're big enough to do both. So that's something that we're very proud of and we wanna continue. And then in terms of the issue about entering the state of Florida, it, it is, it is an issue. People can transfer in, we get a lot of transfer students in, but we also reject, and I hear this around the state from our farmers or farming communities. We have some counties in the state of Florida that, that don't have a single graduate come into the University of Florida, not a single one qualified last year to come in. There are some states that have programs where if you're in the top of your class, you're automatically admitted into the state university system. Um, but we're also, and, and B mentioned this, we're also very cognizant of our rankings, which helps our graduates with their careers and the reputation of the school, but it also has these side effects of being so exclusive for freshman admissions. So that's a challenge that we face. And that's a national problem. And we probably do better than a lot of states because of the opportunity to come in as a junior. Like I was at Wisconsin a few years ago reviewing a department. Like nobody from rural Wisconsin could get in the University of Wisconsin because they didn't have the kind of courses in high school that would let them be competitive and nobody was going to do anything about it. Thank you. Do we have any questions on Zoom? No. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Pete. This was fabulous. Thank you. I learned something here. Oh, <laughs> you. Yeah. And next week we have... Um, a talk on fires, prescribed fires and wildfires, which we hear about all the time on the news, so it should be very interesting. And the speaker is from the College of uh, Forest Services. Is that right? Forest Sciences, something like that. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert, for coming. I appreciate your input and Bill, and of course, Pete. Thank you very much. See you all next week. <laughs>